As we all know, Claude appears in GTA San Andreas, which in the timeline of the GTA universe is actually set before Grand Theft Auto 3. This is where Claude meets Catalina, and he loses his garage in a pink slip race to CJ in San Andreas before then heading to Liberty City with his new girlfriend, who would then go on to become the woman who would betray him in GTA 3 during the introduction. Now, we actually know a lot more than you'd think about what happened to Claude after the events of GTA 3. First of all, in GTA Online, Claude actually appears as a parent model that we can pick to create our characters. And we can actually see an updated version of what Claude might look like if he was in the GTA 5 universe. But the biggest clue comes from Rockstar Games themselves, where in 2011 they did an Ask Us Anything, where they answered some of the fans' biggest questions about GTA 3. That's when many people, as you can imagine, asked Rockstar Games what happened to Claude after the events of the game. And many people wanted to know, is he dead or is he alive? And that's when Rockstar Games confirmed with this message right here. He certainly isn't dead, but what else became of him, we don't know. So Rockstar Games are clearly leaving this open for fan interpretation. However, it's nice to see an actual official confirmation from Rockstar Games 10 years on from its release that Claude is still alive and well, and likely still involved in crime in one way or another. So there you have it, Claude is not dead, and he's certainly still alive. But exactly what happened to him, where he is now, what he's involved with, is a complete mystery. But we're gonna move on now to Tommy Bassetti. And I'll be honest, things aren't looking as good for Tommy as you might think. There's a lot more to go on here than with other protagonists. Firstly, by the end of the game, Tommy Vassetti is finally the man in charge of Vice City. With Ken Rosenberg by his side, we know that the two continued for a short amount of time to operate as we know it and saw in the 2002 game. But there's a few twists here for Tommy because first of all, Tommy was actually supposed to feature in GTA San Andreas as a returning character, but sadly because Rockstar Games fell out with the voice actor Ray Liotta, this never came to fruition. There's a few developers who worked on the game at the time who have commented on the matter. One claiming that his behaviour and ego while recording was completely inappropriate, rude and dismissive of the project's legitimacy as he thought that video games could never compare to movies. Because when Mr. Leota found out how much money the game made, things turned very sour. However, Dan Hauser himself had something very interesting to say about the actors who behave in this way on their projects. He said he made some comments later on through his agent, something like, hey, that game was so big, I should have charged them more money. Dan said, I hate that kind of chat. It's so cheesy. Like he's saying, next time I'm really going to pin it to them. Well, how about we just kill off your character? There is no next time. That's how we handle that. Now, as we know, Rockstar never officially did kill off Tommy Vassetti, but they did do the same thing to Avery Carrington, who was also a voice actor who Rockstar Games hated working with. So, during the introduction of GTA San Andreas, we actually find out some very valuable information about Tommy. Firstly, we see Ken Rosenberg leaving the rehab facility in Fort Carson, and he then locates the nearest payphone in hopes to get through to Tommy himself. And as you can hear from this conversation, he ends up getting through to Tommy's assistant or call handler instead. Tommy Versetti, please. Tell him Ken Rosenberg called. Ken Rosenberg, you haven't heard of me? Who are you? Ken Rosenberg. Rosenberg. Oh, oh really? You told him I called? Look, I made that ingrate, and now he will take my calls? Just put him on the phone right now. Hello? Hello? It seems that Tommy is dodging Ken Rosenberg's calls now and likely sent him to this rehabilitation center in order to clean up his growing drug habits, but why is Tommy ignoring Ken's calls now? We don't know. We also hear Ken mention Tommy briefly during the mission where we have to clean out this warehouse from the Mafia. This is so exciting, Tommy. It's like old times. Who the fuck is but there's something else really interesting I want to direct your attention towards. There's one last clue that proves Tommy was likely still alive in at least the year 2002. And we say this because a promotional website called Kentpool.com 
or Kent Paul's 80s Nostalgia Zone was released as a promo campaign for the release of GTA Vice City. And this was supposed to be a retro blog of sorts run by Kent Paul himself where he reminisces on the 80s and what life was like in Vice City. Now this website has now sadly been taken down but it had some really cool awesome information on it where one of the posts read, See Tom, I didn't mention your name. Maybe you won't get us killed now, okay? So this blog was obviously meant to be Kent Paul basically reminiscing on the 80s and was basically him talking from the year 2002. So maybe Rockstar Games didn't silently kill off Tommy Vecetti's character, but uh, I guess it's all up to interpretation once again. So let me know what you think about that, because we're going to move on now to CJ from GTA San Andreas. We know that CJ went on to become very successful. As we know, CJ owns stakes in a ton of businesses throughout San Andreas, ranging from casinos, garages, and also is the manager for the rap icon Mad Dog. We also know at the end of GTA San Andreas, we get a cutscene that suggests that Mad Dog is heading on a tour across the world, and it's likely that CJ will come along and join him on this. In GTA 5, however, Grove Street is now Baller's territory, and the Grove Street that once existed is no longer as we know it in GTA San Andreas. We hear an NPC mention OG Johnson in GTA 5 as well. We also get to see CJ on various billboards across Liberty City in GTA 4, where in this one particularly, he is uh, sporting some luxury clothing brands. So possibly he is either the model or the face of the entire brand altogether, which suggests to us here that he's a well-known icon or business magnate within the GTA universe after the 90s, and at least in 2008 is either still operating highly successful or of course very famous to be used on this billboard right here. We also then have this really cool secret dialogue between Franklin and Lamar where they mention where the original Grove Street families are now in the year 2013 and the modern day. Hey, you know Grove Street used to be familyhood. Grove Street family? Man, long time ago. Man, what happened to them dudes? Shit, I don't know. Could be dead. Shit, or could be CEOs by now. Or probably living in some suburb somewhere, driving SUVs and shit, you know, soccer moms and shit, coaching little league football team. Yeah, the suburban flight, huh? Probably so. We also know that CJ never really wanted to continue gangbanging and being a member of the Grove Street family. You don't want to be in the hood? No, that's exactly where I want to be. Look like base heads and took over the spot. Let's go home. This is home, man. So it's likely that he encouraged Sweet to leave the gang life behind and go on to build bigger and better things for themselves and chase their career in the music business and casinos. They likely left Grove Street behind, which is where then of course in the events of GTA 5 in modern day, Grove Street is now the baller's territory. We also see this cool toothpaste easter egg which says CJ's toothpaste which can be found in various bathrooms across GTA 5. It might be a bit of a stretch but maybe CJ has his own stake in a toothpaste company? I don't know. So things are looking quite promising for CJ and it's likely that he isn't dead. So now next time someone tells you that the universes are different and CJ never existed in GTA 5, give them a middle finger and say at least his lore definitely did and the history as well. Next up we have Nico Bellic. Well, Nico has had a tragic life in Liberty City, and the canon ending of GTA 4 is considered to be the revenge ending, which we'll discuss in a few moments time why that is. Uh, and in this ending he sadly loses his girlfriend Kate, but continues to have Roman by his side. We know that Nico pulled off a successful bank heist in GTA 4 during the mission Three Leaf Clover, and that's something that didn't go unnoticed by Lester in GTA 5. Round up some of the old guys. They're are no old guys. Moses, uh, ironically, he found Jesus. Uh, all those Irish crazies, they mostly just disappeared. That crew from the south, they all went down. There was uh, an Eastern European guy making moves in Liberty City, but uh, he went quiet. So this is very interesting. It likely means that Nico went quiet and either left Liberty City or completely avoided the life of crime altogether after the ending of GTA 4. I believe that Nico could have moved to Vice City or possibly remained within Liberty City, just instead no longer pursuing any sort of life of crime for the remainder of his time there. However, he's still a wanted man proven in this next clue right here, another easter egg in GTA 5, 
where we can find a wanted poster for Nico hidden in an abandoned building in the desert. This poster can actually be found as a promotional image by Rockstar Games where as you can see here in the full on version it says he's wanted for a shooting in a nightclub in Hove Beach referring to the mission The Master and the Molotov in GTA 4, where Dmitry Raskolov has us take out and clip Mikhail Faustin in the nightclub just round the corner in Hove Beach, which we can also find a Life Invader post for Nico in GTA 5, as well as another hidden Easter egg, where we can also see that Roman has wished him a happy birthday. So there we go, that confirms that the ending of GTA 5 was canon for the revenge ending, because Roman is still alive, and posting on Nico's Life Invader page. So that likely means that Nico is probably still alive and Roman is in the year 2013. But with Lester confirming that the guy, Nico Bellic, Eastern European guy that pulled off a bank job in Liberty City, has now gone quiet, it's likely that Nico is alive and well and is just instead just not doing anything in the criminal underworld and instead is trying to live a happy and calm lifestyle. So we're going to touch on the 3D era spin-offs in a few moments time, but we now move on to GTA 5 where we know that the official canon ending was the option C, Death Wish, where Franklin decides not to kill Michael, not to kill Trevor, and instead to join the three together in order to take out everyone who has wronged them throughout the game. This is then further confirmed where in GTA Online we have a variety of heists that actually finally feature Trevor where we can clearly see he hasn't changed and nor will he ever probably change either which is probably a good thing because we all love Trevor and his crazy antics. There's also the mission for the contract featuring Franklin and Lamar where we get to play as both of them and Franklin confirms on one of the missions when he returns home that he now has kids and a girlfriend that he lives with in his home up in the hills. Hey, what's up? Can a low come up in your crib? Man, fuck you, man. My kid's up in there. I don't want your ass up in my house. And we also know that Franklin is very successful and wealthy because when we purchase the agency, Franklin takes us through the business and how it will operate, obviously very clearly involved in this kind of thing. And it's nice to see that Franklin has gone a more legitimate route after the events of GTA 5. But Michael, however, is the only character that we still don't have a definitive answer as to what happened to him after the events of GTA 5 single player. However, we're still yet to receive a Michael DLC for GTA Online, but if we do, it's likely going to be based around the movie studio, maybe featuring some absolutely crazy missions disguised as movie sets or something, which would be really cool. I think that's a cool idea. But as we know, Michael is now essentially a film director or producer, and so he probably resumed his life within that. And until we get a DLC add-on pack for GTA 5 explaining that, we still haven't yet had a GTA title since GTA 5, so we can't definitively actually say what has happened to Michael. So I guess we're going to have to leave that one there as we move on to the 3D era games and talk about Tony Cipriani from Liberty City Stories now. Tony Cipriani from Liberty City Stories is an interesting one because Tony left Liberty City and decided to lay low in Vice City after killing a rival made man, but however he does finally return to Liberty City in 1998 ready to continue his life in the organised crime business. And so Salvatore Leone gives Tony jobs to do and throughout the game in Liberty City Stories that's essentially what we're doing. It's not until GTA 3 which takes place in 2001 where we see that Tony is still living with his mother and is frequently seen in his family run restaurant. We know that in GTA 3 Salvatore Leone tries to kill Claude with a car bomb and that's where Claude retaliates and kills Salvatore. We don't really hear from Tony for the rest of GTA 3 However, it's then presumed that for the remainder of time and what happened to Tony after the events of GTA 3, which technically takes place after Liberty City Stories, is that he went on to take over Salvatore's business because Salvatore's son, Joey, isn't exactly a guy who's done much to help out the family throughout the game. And so therefore, Tony Cipriani was the most likely candidate to take over the business afterwards. Next up we have Vic Vance from Vice City Stories. Arguably Vic Vance is the nicest GTA protagonist of all of them throughout the entire GTA franchise. Throughout the game he never really wants to be deeply involved in his brother Lance's shenanigans and drug dealing situations. That then throws him into a world of organised crime and let's just say Vic was really good at it. He built up a huge empire and it was a huge shame to see the way that Vic's story ends because this is probably the only GTA protagonist where we have a definitive answer as to what happened to him 
besides Johnny from The Lost and Damned, who died because obviously, as we know, Trevor stomped on his head. So as we know, in the events of GTA Vice City at the very beginning of the game, we have Tommy that meets up with Lance Vance and Vic Vance at the start of the game. Lots of people might not have noticed this, but unfortunately, the character who dies in this drug deal gone wrong at the start of the game was Vic Vance. So there we have it. The ending of Vic was very tragic. He was killed by a drug deal gone wrong, likely because Lance convinced him to go along as he was always trying to do throughout the entire Vice City stories game, and therefore Vic Vance was killed there on the spot at the Vice City docks. 